Good evening, and well, welcome to our tent meeting tonight, and uh, we've uh, been having a good time, and um, the Lord has been blessing each night as we've been seeing people really seeking the Lord, and it's, we've seen some really good things taking place, and uh, let's open with a prayer with prayer tonight. Father, we pray that you would just bless our night. Lord, we realize it's kind of cool out and it's been kind of a miserable day. But God, we just pray that you would move by your spirit here tonight and glorify your name. Thank you for those who have come and we thank you, Lord, for those who are watching on television tonight. And we just pray that you would bless each one in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to do a couple of choruses, uh, start things out. And, um, well, actually, the first one I think we ought to start out with is that old, old actually, it's an old hymn, How Great Thou Art. Beautiful 
hopeless situation, the joy of the hood is smelt side on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. It is smelt side on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. One more time, great is so and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in the mountain of His holiness beautiful for situation the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion the sides of the north the city of the great King is Mount Zion Well, we're going to get right into some of our singing here, and um, we're going to give something a try here. We haven't done this in, in the Coons' age. So I, I hope this goes okay. If it doesn't go okay, you can laugh, it's all right. Just not too loud, all right. But this is a song that I wrote back a long time ago, back in 1974. And um, we put it on one of our record albums and uh, we haven't done it since, really, I think we we tried it, Sid, so I don't know. We had to drop the key down a whole long ways, but we'll find out what happens, okay? Get your fingers on. G. G. Yep. I am singing glory Since Jesus came in He saved my soul And now I'm free I'm singing glory Now that's my story Now it's mine That is divine I'm singing glory, hallelujah, he is mine, he is with me all the time, he'll never let me go, till I stand before his throne, hallelujah, I love him, for he's my my King, hallelujah, I'm singing glory, for He is my friend, to Him I can go, when I fall in sin, I'm singing glory, I'll never be sorry, I'm following Him. This life was in, I'm singing glory, hallelujah, he is mine, he is 
with me all the time. He'll never let me go till I stand before his throne. Hallelujah, I love him for he's my Lord. So I will sing for he's my King. singing glory for Jesus is mine I gave my life to him and now he is mine I'm singing glory so please hear my story he will save you make your life a new so you can sing glory with me all the time. He'll never let me go till I stand before his throne. Hallelujah, I love him for he's my Lord. So I will sing for he's my King. Thank you. I don't know. Do we sing at the fair? I think I did. Yeah. That's been a long time ago. <laughs> a couple of weeks anyway. <laughs> oh, amen. Yeah, brings back a lot of memories, though, some of the old songs. And, and uh, anyway, we're going to ask Martin and Tom to come and do a song for you tonight.
you know, as a fairly new Christian, uh, there's a lot to learn. Well, there's a lot to learn no matter how old you get. And, uh, but I was learning some basic principles about walking with God and, and the times of, you know, messing things all up and returning to some of the past life. And, and uh, you know, Jesus even talked about the, the hog returning to its wallow and the dog returning to its vomit. And, uh, I mean, that's a pretty gross picture, but sin is pretty gross in the eyes of God. And, uh, and so that's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to get back up and go and make our footprints hit in the right direction. And I'm so glad that God doesn't stomp on us like a bug when we mess up. Isn't that great? But he just picks up the pieces and, and uh, gives us new life and encouragement and away we go again. And that's just the way life is. That's why grace is so amazing. But he gave me a song back then that was uh, a prayer, just a prayer. In fact, this was uh, the year I met Brenda. And uh, he gave me this, this song back then. I'm sorry, Lord, I played the fool again. I took my eyes off Jesus and fell right back and said, I feel so ashamed and unclean inside again. I'm sorry, Lord, I hurt you. Please take me back again. My spirit wants to serve you. My flesh seeks its own gain. It'd rather serve the world of sin and let the devil reign. And if I'd let this old flesh have its way, it would leave Christ standing so far away. I'm sorry, Lord, I played the fool again. I took my eyes off Jesus and fell right back in sin. I feel so ashamed and I'm clean inside again. I'm sorry, Lord, I hurt you. Please take me back again I know you died for me My debt to sin is paid I know that souls like me Are what you came to say And so, dear Lord I want to live for you if only the soul heart of mine would be true. Thank you, Lord, you took away my sin. Thank you that you heard me when I prayed again. Return to me. The joy that once was mine And fill me with thy spirit Use me, Lord, now I am thine Amen. Thanks so glad he was there to hear me that time and the next time and all the times after that. And uh, anyway, I'm so thankful for the verse. Uh, there was a high school teacher. He, it wasn't in school, but in a tent like this up at Pine Lake that shared with me 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He said, that comes from a God who cannot lie. <laughs> I'm glad. 
you know, talking about grace. Um, what do you think of that sign out here that uh, stands out here uh, announcing these tent meetings? And, uh, you know, it's beautiful, and I just want to thank Jared and Grace are sitting over here. They're the ones that designed it and made it, painted it, did everything. And they just did a super job. Thank you so much. It just stands up here. Yeah. And they're newly friends and working together. Isn't that great? Yes, amen. <laughs> I was going to make an announcement tonight. I was going to say that because it's kind of cold in here, is that different than it was just a week or two ago? I mean, we were all sweating like crazy. Now, I was going to say, if you get cold, you can sit close together. They beat me to it. So, <laughs> well, While they're coming up here, let me do a uh, song that's just an old song that I, I loved for the many years. My God and I go through the fields together. We walk and talk as good friends should and do.
serve you right And be sure you stay right across the land With the rifle in his saddle And the Bible in his hand He told the prairie people All about the promised land As he went riding Singing down the trail Leading, leading Safe and secure Well, praise the Lord, we're going to, uh, we're going to receive an offering tonight and for the, uh, for these meetings, and, uh, you know, it's a step of faith, and I know we're not a huge crowd tonight, we're just asking you to do what you can, and, uh, God is the one who meets the needs. Isn't this a beautiful tent? And the thing, you know, last year our tent went down and it was uh, destroyed. But it's after the meetings were done. And then people kept, you know, contacting us and said, Are you going to do a get another tent meeting next year? And we said, We don't have a tent. And uh, we showed a picture, put a picture in our newsletter about the tent that had gone down. And, and uh, we get a phone call from a couple in another state, and they said, don't tell anybody who we are. They want God's, you know, uh, they, they, they don't want the applause of man. They want to just give it to the Lord. And they said, would you go out and find, and see what you can find a tent, see what it would cost. And so we went out and started looking, and we found that used tents, that were probably half rotten already were costing the same as a new forget. And so we talked to the Lord about it and we kept looking and uh, and David found a place down in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin that make these tents and uh, and asked them, well, what's the price and all and, uh, and the guy that he talked to said to him, David, or he said, are you, uh, do you pray for the sick? And David said, yeah. He says, then I'll give you a good discount. And, uh, and so anyway, we uh, contacted the people who uh, 
made the offer and they paid the entire price. And they're not cheap, I'll tell you, but it's a beautiful tent. It's bigger than what we had asked for. We needed a trailer and we got a newer one that we asked for and it was bigger than we asked for too. And uh, then we uh, let people know we were going to need chairs. Well, we got more chairs than we were expecting and not only that, they got their padded. Isn't that nice? You know, it's not just the way the Lord works. And uh, so we've come into these meetings for two weeks and uh, so these go, this goes through the 18th, and uh, right now it's a busy time. There's a lot of farmers that are out and doing harvesting, and so it's a busy time. And then when the weather all of a sudden turned on us, you know, and some people are a little nervous about sitting in a tent when the weather is kind of like this. Appreciate you being here, but I do want you to know that the last couple of nights we have seen a number of people here at the altar and we've seen God doing beautiful things. And uh, in fact, this afternoon while we were sitting here, not in the tent, we're just down by our, we got our uh, fifth wheel desk down behind here, below the woods here in a nice soft, nice place. And here a uh, lady comes walking down there and she said, would you pray for me? So we had a little prayer meeting down there this afternoon and so we're, I'm just camping out down here. And uh, so anytime that, here most of the time, but anytime you need prayer, you know, just come on over. And that's, where, that's the reason that we're here, is to talk and pray and seek the Lord. But anyway, we're going to receive an offering. And so if, uh, if we could get... There we got a good usher. You know what? When you get an usher that's nice and strong. That's not a good sign. <laughs> yeah, any checks you're making out, make them to Glory Land. So, uh, well, let's uh, let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you tonight for the privilege of giving, the privilege of ministering, and thank you, Lord. This place has been dedicated for this purpose the touch hearts for Jesus. And so, Lord, we're asking that as these, their folk, make an investment in the kingdom of God in the souls of man. May they give in joy as to what you would desire from them. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your offering and also uh, for the music. People have asked us, why, why are you doing this? And for go for two whole weeks. Back when uh, David and I were kids was when the uh, uh, folks found out that um, there was going to be tent meetings over at Pine Lake. And uh, when I heard there was going to be something in a tent, I thought, well, maybe there's got to be lions and tigers. And, you know, I thought it was going to be a circus of some kind. Well, it was no circus. And uh, we got there. Uh, the music was super. Preaching was great. And and God moved by His Spirit. And those meetings went on night after night. I don't remember how long. But I know that God really touched my our family's lives and had no idea that years later we would be standing in a tent like this proclaiming that same gospel and asking people to come give their lives to Christ but I believe we are standing at a time in history in which we need a move of God we see what's going on in the world today and we need a touch of God in America like never before. But not only that, I believe we are standing on the threshold of the coming of Jesus Christ. It's a good time to walk with God. I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. Father God, we pray that you would just speak to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you are doing a mighty work even now. Thank you for what you've already done in these days. And Lord, as we go into the, the days to come, we pray that you would move by your Spirit and that many shall come and have a touch of God in their life. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. These meetings are going on every night at 7 o'clock through the 18th of this month. And so two full weeks of meetings and uh, so pray with us that God will touch a lot of hearts and uh, we've, been, we've been talking to a lot of people and they're excited about it and they said we can't wait it's gonna, we're going to want to be here for this and uh, things come up and uh, the devil doesn't want them here but uh, be in prayer with us and then Sunday evening this coming Sunday now uh, Rusty Chords will be here and they will be singing. And then on uh, the following Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, Dan and Marilee Otteson will be here and they will be not only singing, they will, Dan will also be sharing the word for those two nights. So keep that in mind. And also, the, uh, these meetings are all being uh, put on our website for uh, our uh, we're putting them on the Ghost of Church website, and uh, and so these are going out. Will be on on the air, and so we, you can be watched on that as well. And uh, this is an exciting thing because we've been having an average of about two thousand hits every week on that website, on YouTube, and so we're just expecting great things from God. As you can see, the, the uh, sign up here is taken from uh, the, the book, of, uh, book of Luke, chapter 4, uh, beginning with the verse, uh, well, it start, uh, the, the verse up here is verse 18, but it goes from 16 to 19. And uh, Jesus went into the temple, and this is the very beginning of his ministry, but this very time it set a tone for what he was going to do in the future as far as his, his ministry. And it says that as he entered into the temple, into the synagogue, he, uh, it, the Bible, the scriptures were given to him and there was the book of Isaiah 
was handed to him and he read from it and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Last night as I was sitting here while uh, the uh, clients were up here ministering, I was looking at that sign again. And those first words, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. And, uh, you know, we tend to look at people who are financially rich and we feel kind of financially poor. But you know we're all poor in the eyes of God if we don't have Jesus. Because the riches of this world don't last long. We were out in Montana one time in this town and it wasn't a very, very large town. It's probably like Boston or Bagley, something like that. And we're having meetings in that town and there were cars all over that town. I mean, it was just uh, cars all over the place. And we got to the church, we asked the pastor, what's going on here? And he said, the richest man in the whole area of this area of Montana died and his funeral is today. So he have all these friends? And they said, no, they just want to find out what he left behind. And then this, this man was super wealthy, all kinds of land, all kinds of money. When he died, he died a poor man. His pockets were empty. You know, no one is ever buried with pockets full of money. The family makes sure of that. And so this man, he died and he had nothing in his pockets. He left everything behind. Like the man was asked, man, man who had died, and somebody said, I wonder what he left behind. And the person he was talking to said, everything. Left everything behind. We are poor without Jesus Christ because the richest man that's ever walked this earth without God is no richer than the poorest man. Jesus said I came to, to uh, I was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. You know we ask the question okay so what really what uh, the gospel means the good news and uh, and we have the gospels of Matthew Mark Luke and John and these books are the good news and the reason they're good news they talk about heaven have you ever wondered what heaven looks like and uh, you know uh, last night they prayed for me here because it was three years ago yesterday that my wife went to heaven and I thought a lot of times about her. I wonder what she's doing today. I wonder how exciting it is. But you see, God gave me a dream not too long after she went home. And I, I saw her come to me. And she was young as could be. And uh, she was like, looked like about 19 or 20 years old. And she was so beautiful. And uh, so slim and trim and, you know, uh, time does things to our bodies, especially when you have four kids in rapid succession. And uh, anyway, but when she, when she came to me, she was slim and trim and just radiant with the joy of the Lord. She couldn't stand still. She was, when, when she left here, she had a walker. She didn't need a walker when she came to me. She was just about dancing. Her feet were just, she couldn't keep them still. And, the, and her face was so full of joy and so excited. And she said, come run with me. My, I haven't heard that in a long time. 
didn't come around with me and she turned and she started running away and I ran after her as fast as I could. I couldn't catch up. And, I, I, and then she turned back and she looked at me and she was laughing and she said, hurry up! Like there was something she wanted to show me. And then she turned away and she faded out. And I woke up. And I'm laying there in my bed and there's tears in my eyes, not because I'm sad, but I'm laying there and I'm saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, you allowed me to see what she looks like now. And you are making her happier than I ever could. Thank you, Jesus, for taking her home. But what is heaven like? We try to imagine that the Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them. You know, we're talking with people who are looking at the world's situation. And you know, it's full of bad news. Every time you turn on the news, you get more bad news. If it's not bad enough on NBC, just turn over to CBS and you can get it again. I mean, this thing is just bad, bad, bad. People are getting depressed. And they're saying, what's the reason to even live when this world is getting worse every day? Oh, could you use a little good news tonight? We're here to give you good news because Jesus said, I came to give you good news. And you know, the greatest news of all is the fact that heaven is for real. It's not just a pipe dream. Heaven is real. And to think, when you walk through those gates, you know, isn't this a beautiful spot to know that this was a hayfield? not very long ago and the hay stood tall and they uh, came out here and they they cut the hay now I know this doesn't look much like a hay field after it's hay's been cut they also brought a lot of mower in here and mowed it down so it's nice and easy and not, so it, it looks beautiful they've done a super job and uh, but you know the the in heaven the grass is uniform size in size. There are no cut edges to the grass. It's all uniform, and there's no weeds in the lawns. No weeds whatsoever. You don't have to worry about dandelions coming up. It's all perfect, and it's so thick that when you walk on it in bare feet, you can't even touch the ground. It's so soft. And uh, how do I know? Because the Lord gave me a dream and I walked in heaven. And that's been, that's been way back in 1978 when God gave me that dream. And I stood there in that grass and my feet I, had, I didn't have any shoes on and I, I normally don't walk barefooted because I got tender feet. And I was walking in there on this grass and it was cool. Oh, it felt so good. I could feel life just coming right up through my legs. And you just want to stand there and go, oh, that feels so good. So peaceful. And, and as I was standing there, I noticed I don't have to labor to breathe. You know, it's work to breathe. And you don't have to labor to breathe celestial air, to breathe the heavenly air. It just comes into you and makes you so alive. Everything around you is alive. And... And as you're breathing this air, you just want to go. <sighs> the joy, the sheer joy. 
and people asked me, you know, what else do you see? And so I looked over my right and here was a flower, flower bed that was so beautiful. Oh, you know there was not a single weed in it. And that all the flowers in there, there wasn't a single blade, a, not a single petal on any of the flowers that was any way wilted. They were all in full bloom. And all these flowers of every size, every description, every color, colors we don't even have here. And they were all gently waving not together like there was a wind blowing because there was no wind but each one was independently waving like they were praising God like they were praising God oh I'll tell you it's so beautiful then I smelled this fragrance of, wow I've never smelled anything like that it was a, you just want to stand there and go Oh, I said, and I didn't have to ask a question in my mouth, just in my mind. What is that beautiful fragrance? And the answer came right into my mind. And the answer was this. That beautiful fragrance is the prayers of God's people. This is what God feels when you pray. It's a sweet fragrance to him, and he loves to hear your voice. And all through eternity, you're going to be reminded of those times when everything was going wrong, and, and you laid probably in your bed or wherever, and you're saying, Oh, God, God, speak to my heart. I love you. And we'll be reminded of those days when we probably thought our prayers hadn't gone that high and God says oh they came all the way to me I heard every word you said because I love you people have asked me what was the most spectacular thing that you saw And it wasn't what I saw with my eyes. By the way, there's no shadows in it. But it's so light. But the thing that blessed me so much, and I enjoyed so much, was sensing the presence of God. You know, when the morning after we laid my wife to rest, I went for a walk. The sun has just come up. And the Lord and I, we cried together for a bit. Yeah, he does that because he feels our hurts. So we cried together for a bit and then I all of a sudden, I just sensed and felt like the arms of God had wrapped around me. And I felt that glorious presence when I needed it the most. Sometimes you feel like, oh, is God here? I could just sense his presence. But in heaven, you always sense the presence of God because he fills heaven with his presence. And it always feels like you're getting hugged by Jesus, wouldn't that? Isn't that great? I, I'm a I'm a hugger. I love hugs. And uh, but to think that heaven is full of God's hugs for us, we need that. Aren't you anxious to go to heaven? Oh, you know, I, I started telling people about what I had seen. And uh, some, you know, pastors I, I respected for years. I told them what I'd seen in this dream, and they said, What did you eat before you went to bed that night? 
They didn't believe anything. How can you believe a dream? Does God do such a thing? And you know what? I plunged into despair. I'd gone from this high that I can't express to a low where I'd never walked before. Because it wasn't believed. We went on a tour out to Montana and then we were with an old couple there in Montana, pastor and his wife, and he said, where are you going from here? Well, we are going all the way to the coast. And he said, are you going into Oregon? I said, yeah, a little bit. Well, he said, you've got to go and visit some friends of ours. And they're in Oregon City. And they gave us the address. They said, you have to tell them your dream. Well, we made our way out there and knocked on the door. And this old couple, they come and they walk together. They had to, it's the only way they could walk. Their health was so poor, was so poor that they couldn't walk individually. They had to hold each other up. Good thing was that if they fell, at least they didn't fall alone. But uh, they would hold each other up and they'd go visit the shut-ins. Amazing, amazing godly couple. Well, they brought us in and this dear old lady, we sat down and she sat right close to me and she said, she said, Carrie, can you tell me what you saw when you stood in heaven? I went through what I've just gone through with you. And this lady sat there and the tears had running down her cheeks. And I thought, boy, she sure is an emotional little gal. And then she said to me, she said, not too long ago, my heart stopped. And for a little while, she said, I was clinically dead. And then she said with a cracked voice, she said, Gary, I stood in the same place you stood. And she said, Gary, you, you described this. And, and she told me back there was more that, that, uh, than what I've told you here, but things. And she said, you said, told me about this. And I said, yeah. She said, on the other side of that was there this. And then she described something. I said, well, yeah. And then it's to the left of that. And we went back and forth, back and forth. And we were both crying. Because we had stood at the same exact place. And there is no mistake about it. It was after that I went back home again and I wrote my first book, Till I See Him. God had shown me it was real. Aren't you anxious for heaven? Is, is there any better news? that heaven is real. But you know, there's, have you heard, you know, you've heard this, well, I've got good news and i got bad news, which do you want first? Well, I gave you the best news first. What is the bad news? The Bible says, but our sins have separated us from God that he will not hear. And he goes on, the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, that all have sinned to come short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. Now that's the bad news. Because we are all born in sin, the Bible says that we've all sinned, not just a few. We've all sinned, and that sin has separated us from God. 
That is why Jesus said, I have come to bring you good news. And that good news was what he delivered on the cross. When he died for our sins, to take it away, that he took our place so that we could be totally forgiven. Back a couple of few years ago, I was working and driving sugar beet truck up in Warren. And uh, we were all done and ready to take off for home. And well, the last, I guess the last day we were working there, my truck caught fire. Oh, it was a hot day. And I got the fire up, but the truck wouldn't run afterwards. And, and so the boss came to me and he said, Gary, he said, you getting about ready to go? I said, yeah. He said, Gary, would you, would you go with me out and tow your truck back to the shop so we can get it fixed? I said, sure, I can do that. And, uh, and then, I mean, this fellow, he is so neat, just, an, just the most wonderful guy. He said, I'm not quite ready to go, but he said, why don't you have a cup of coffee? I said, he was a nice guy. And he had good coffee, too. Not, not like yours, Lori, but it was, it was wonderful coffee. By the way, she gives me lots of coffee. Her camper's sitting right next to mine. Their, their camper's right next to mine, and they've got coffee, too. But you can't have none. But... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, he said, I want a cup of coffee. I sat down next to a fellow. I hadn't seen him before because he didn't drive one of the trucks during Sugar Beach, but he drove a tractor out in the fields. And I'd hear his voice all the time over the radio. And here he's sitting there, and, uh, and Mike puts my coffee cup right next to this fella, and uh, we called him Gino. And he sat next to him, and he's and so I sat there next to this fellow, who had some very interesting language, words I never learned in our home. And there we talked and talked, and I, you know this is really neat. God knows what He's doing. And finally, Mike comes back. He says, oh, you ready to go? I said, yeah, my coffee cup's empty. My heart's full. We went and uh, got done and got the job done. And before I left for home, I said to Mike, Mike, anytime, anytime you need prayer, anytime you need me, call me. Sunday morning, we were in church. We got done with our service in church. And on the way home, I just got home, my phone rang, and it was Mike. And he said, Gary, we just flew Gino to the hospital in Fargo. We think he had a stroke. We found him unconscious in a tractor. I dropped Lois off and turned around and headed for Fargo got down there and walked in the intensive care of that hospital and there lay Gino unresponsive but I prayed for him walked out he was walking past the waiting room the intensive care waiting room I saw people in there I stepped in and he was his family and I waited while as the doctor was explaining to the family, Gino had had, had a, um, a brain tumor and had to have surgery if he woke up. And so we, I, then the people, they went and I told the family, I said, oh, Pastor, can I pray with you? So I did, and just like I got done praying, Someone grabbed my arm, spun me around. There was a young woman. She said, are you a pastor? And I said, yes. Come with me. Next thing I know, I'm going down the hallway into the intensive care. I didn't know who she was. Got in there and she told me, she said, my mother-in-law had a stroke. We don't think she's going to make it. Could you pray for her? 
walked in. There was a man and a woman standing there and I walked over and I prayed for this dear lady. Just got done praying with her and, and this young fella standing there, he looked at me really strange. To that point, he was the only one that ever asked me this question. He said, are you an angel? I've heard that since. Are you an angel? <laughs> I feel like say, you ought to ask my wife that question. She'd get a good laugh out of it. But I said, no. I said, I am a servant of the Lord. Well, in the process of it all, the young woman that brought me in got to pray with her and she gave her heart to Jesus Christ. Well, I went back home and just a few days later, I get a call again. They said, Gino woke up. And Gino's having surgery, a brain surgery to move the tumor. And he wants to see him. And you've only got, I forget how much time it was, but I looked at my watch and I thought, oh, I've got to move right now. I took off for Fargo and I figured <laughs> after I get there I'll have to do some repenting because I'm not going to be going speed limit. I got down there and as I can, got into the hospital started walking down the aisle. The hallway I heard the boys say, he's here, pastor's here. I walked in, in that room and there was Gino, his face full of fear. It was almost time for him to go into surgery. I got right to the point and I said, Gino, have you ever given your heart to Jesus? He just says, no. I said, Gino, do you know where you're gonna go if you died on that operating table? He just says, no. Do you wanna know? He says, yes. And I said, Gino, there's something keeping you out of heaven. It's sin. I said, Gino, if God allowed you and your friends into heaven just the way you are, what would heaven be like? He looked at me and tears in his eyes. He said, it would be just like this earth. I said, you're right. Heaven is a holy place. I said, Gina, now remember, this is a farmer I'm talking about. I said, Gino, if you want to get into heaven, you have to unload your sin. I said, Gino, are you ready to unload your sin and let Jesus take it away? He says, yes. Just like that, we prayed. Now remember, we're waiting for the nurses to come in to wheel them away. We just said amen. And he looked up at me with joy in his face. He said, I'm not afraid anymore. And the door opened. And here comes the nurses. And he, wa he was wheeled into the operating room with a smile on his face. You see, we can't get into heaven with our sin. That's the bad news. The good news, there's a way to unload it. Leaving it here and letting Jesus take it all away and cleanse us completely. You know, when we were hauling sugar beets, when we get the beets all unloaded and uh, then they dump the tear in the truck, the dirt and stuff, we'd haul it back out to the field and raise the, boy, the, the box and hope it all came out. 
and if it didn't come out, then you had to either climb in there or something and try to get it out. I did that one time and I couldn't get out of the box. I had to call for help. That makes you feel silly. Somebody help me out of my truck. <laughs> After that, I wasn't so concerned about getting all the dirt out. But if you want the joy of Jesus and the peace that passes all understanding here, you have to unload all. Not reserving anything but saying, God, I want to be fit for heaven. I'm going, I want to go to a place where sin does not exist. And Lord, we just unload every single one. I don't reserve any for myself. My habits, take them all away, everything. You know, one time, there was a lady came to our service and she was one of those prim ladies. I mean, there wasn't a hair out of place on her head. Not too many hairs out of place on mine either, but different reason, there's not that many there. But her hair was just, her hairdo was just perfect, you know. And she walked in, you know, and talk about class. I felt uncomfortable. I'm not used to that. And she just kind of walked in so nice, you know. She says, Pastor, I, I, I would like you to pray for me. I said, okay. I said, what do you need prayer for? Well, she said, you know, it's nothing really major, but she said, I've got this little habit, and uh, I think maybe God would like to have me get rid of it. It's nothing major, but I said, what's your little habit? And, well, um, uh, she said, it's cigarettes. And I know they're not really good for me. And so, uh, uh, when you pray that God will help me I'll get rid of them. Oh, I love this. I said, I sure will. I reach up, I put my hand on her hair, and I found out why there was no hairs out of place. It was like putting her hand on a mannequin. I, I don't know how much hairspray she must have used, but it was like putting my hand on a rock. Then, boom. Nothing, every, every hair moved, you know. And so I prayed. I said, Lord, you heard her request. She wants to get rid of this cigarette habit. And so, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, take it away. Then if she ever picks up another cigarette again, make her feel like she's going to die. Amen. <laughs> you should have seen the look on her face. She looked at me, her eyes are kind of big. She says, I didn't want to get rid of it that bad. We must be willing to unload every sin. That's the good news. Jesus wipes them all away. All the way. Do you know there's not a single habit God cannot break? Isn't that right? Not a single habit. God wants you free so that you can stand before Him, so you can be facing the day you stand before Him with a smile on your face. I am clean. I'm clean. Washed in the blood 
of the Lamb. Amen. Perhaps tonight, perhaps tonight you're not 100% sure your sins have been forgiven. And maybe you're still hanging on to a few things that you just aren't willing to to give to Jesus. God wants you free. He wants you to be free from your sin. But you have to give it to Him. I'm going to ask David to come back up and uh, we're going to have a prayer time while he's coming up. Those of you who are watching on television, you have to make a choice to surrender your heart to the Lord Jesus. If you want to step into heaven one day, do it tonight. Well, we know God's word works. We know he hears and answers prayer and he has the power to change and transform every single person to bring them into his image. You haven't fallen too far to come back as long as there's life with him. As Gary has laid forth the word tonight, of course, the, by far the most important thing is to know Jesus the Savior and to have the assurance of where he'll spend eternity. The scripture I quoted earlier from 1 John 1 9. Now think about that. If we confess our sin, not just admitting we did it, but being willing to turn away from it. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow. That is so neat. And sometimes we can offend somebody and, and uh, maybe try to apologize for maybe something stupid we did or said. And, uh, you know, people can have a hard time forgiving you. And they may hold a grudge. Well, nobody has a right to hold a grudge like God does, but He is so quick to forgive. To make you totally clean. There's a verse I've heard Martin quote many times about uh, we're the righteousness of God in Christ. A brand new creation in Him. Man, I'm sure glad that, that David Johnson who went to the Foston High School and uh, I'm glad he's dead. <laughs> Not there anymore. And nor do I have to answer for things I did back then. You know, I never let the word out, but one time I locked a half a dozen of my classmates on top of the roof of the school. They went up there to smoke, and I got the bright idea just to put the padlock on the chain. Afterward, I thought, I wonder how they're going to get down, but I never dared ask. I thought I might end up dead. I can remember different things. I can tell you some Gary stories, too. I'd love to, actually. But the truth be known, that was another person, too. And uh, there is no judgment with God. There's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit is moving upon the hearts of God's people. For one thing, time is short. I hope you believe that. Time is really short. I mentioned a couple of nights ago, I heard a preacher say, I don't even buy green bananas anymore. We don't know how much time we have, but we sure see Bible prophecy being fulfilled right and left. We are so on the brink, but we're still here. And I see people all around, you know, going up and down this highway, and and sometimes have, you know, uh, see them, rub shoulders with them or whatever, and 
just know that most of them are going to miss out on God. Isn't that a tragedy? The thing is, they don't have to because Jesus paid their price too. But if they're too stubborn, unwilling to receive the gift, it does them no good. But revival causes the church to come alive. Gary was talking about having a deep cleansing. I don't want to get that to you tonight. I mean, as far as another sermon. My turn's twilight. But with what he shared about unloading, that is so vital. And uh, I've been in a crusade before, a revival crusade that went for not two weeks, but four. Over in Dimitri, 1987. The Sutera twins were there. I was pastoring in Bagley. We had a Christian school. And I thought, well, I'll make it over there a few times. Yeah, right. I went to the prayer room, I don't know how many times. And I think we had almost perfect attendance in the four weeks. Night after night. And God was bringing us deeper and deeper. Dealing with sin, things that were going on in me that I didn't have a clue. I didn't know I was grieving God and sinning against Him by this thing and that and that thing. And man, as God pointed it out, it was back to the prayer room and asked for forgiveness for that. And God, would you fill that part with your Holy Spirit? And that's what we want to accomplish here at this tent. We believe that Jesus is able to liberate, set free. We also believe that he is the great physician, the healer. And uh, we're going to give and uh, welcome you to come to the front. We've been sitting a long time. Why don't you stand? Uh, I was ready to stand a little while ago, <laughs> but I can now. But I don't want you uncomfortable so that you're not able to hear what the Spirit is saying to you. There is nothing more important in this life than your response back to God. And that's the way revival happens. We become more clean, more free, more happy, and we get a bigger and bigger passion to share it with other people. And that's the way the gospel is spread. And the Holy Spirit brings boldness. So we dare open our mouth and speak the truth in love. We love them because we know if they don't respond, we know where they're going. And that's forever. So, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I'm going to just give you an opportunity tonight. Just to say, Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. I repent of it. I turn from it. God, I don't want any more of it. I, I want to turn from my sin habits. I want to hate them. And I want to walk with God. So be merciful to me. I humble myself before you. And I call upon you for your help. And then, Lord, we have, we have Christians here that struggle with sin like all of us do. And, Lord, we know that it's your desire that we be set free from every habit, every sinful habit that causes us problem. And maybe some of us have to deal with some forgiveness issues with other people. Even parents or neighbors or whoever it would be. Lord, whatever you're speaking tonight, we pray that you would bring a deliverance. And while we're all together, before we start praying individually, I want to lift up this 15-year-old boy that's in the hospital in Fargo. His mom was here today. He has a twisted intestine. It could be very, very serious. And we ask in the name of Jesus tonight, for a miracle of God. We know you can untwist that. And you can keep the tissues from dying to where he has their parts removed. We pray for his safety. We pray, Lord, for his mom and dad who are probably scared half to death along with other siblings. Lord, come and still the storm. But would you stretch forth your hand to heal? In the mighty name of Jesus, so they can have a testimony to tell, look what Jesus did for me. Just like the crowds followed you. They saw the miracles. They knew you were God. 
And like the church in Acts 4, Lord, I pray, God, stretch forth your hand and do mighty miracles and heal in the name of Jesus. We're asking you to do that tonight for that young man. And then, Lord, we're asking for those here that if there are those who would like prayer to deal with whatever they need to deal with, if they need prayer for healing, Lord, just give them the courage to come and, and we'll join together in prayer. And so we thank and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you're welcome to come to not really an altar, but it's kind of like that. Meeting God in the hayfield. Kind of like Jacob's on a ladder on a hike. <laughs> God met him there. So we're going to be dismissed. And thank you for coming. But you need prayer. Don't take your burden home with you. Get it unloaded because when they come back tomorrow night, God's going to show you something else. Yeah, we're set up here through the 18th, but I'll tell you what. If God is moving and people are still coming, we don't have to quit on the 18th. We're just here. As long as there's needs, as long as people are coming, we'll be here. Okay? Well, God bless you. But God moving, please come. We'll pray with you.